Casca, you villain, what are you doing? According to Plutarch, these were the final words of Julius Caesar. In three days, he was anticipated to leave Rome in order to begin his Parthia campaign to avenge Marcus Crassus. Caesar was expected to be gone for years, and so during one of his final meetings at the Senate, the conspirators, including Brutus, had decided that this was the perfect time to make their move. On this day, Caesar would be surrounded by dozens of senators that he had previously pardoned in the deadly Roman Civil War. These men had all pledged loyalty to Caesar and were scheduled for consulships and other titles for their loyalty. So why is it that on March 15th, 44 BC, they decided to assassinate the man that not only pardoned them, but rewarded them? In order to answer this question, we must study the violent events in the preceding decades that would come to encapsulate and define the late Republic era. Although Tiberius Gracchus had been assassinated in 133 BC, his rise and fall would live on in the memories of leading Romans. Tiberius was one of the ten annually elected tribunes of the plebs. The tribune was the first office of the Roman state that was open to plebeians. Its authority was an important check on the power of the senate, for tribunes could propose legislation without having to go through them. But most importantly, they could veto legislation passed by the consuls. And Tiberius had used his power to pass a law confirming the legal limit of public land each individual was permitted to occupy and redistributing the rest of it to poor citizens. But what made this so controversial was that many wealthy senators stood to lose a significant amount of property. And because of these fears of diminished wealth, the senate refused to approve the law. Tiberius therefore violated tradition and took the law directly to the popular assembly for a vote which had a much higher chance of passing. Senators would view this as an attempt by Tiberius to gain massive popularity with the people and perhaps wield it into something more dangerous. Roman senators were usually terrified of losing their power or seeing one man hold too much of it. They started to believe that Tiberius was becoming too radical and when a colleague attempted to stop the passage of the law by issuing a veto, Tiberius had the man deposed from office. And Tiberius would violate norms again by standing for election the following year. This action prompted extreme protests from many of the Roman senators. And when the consul at the time refused to take any action to stop his election, some senators stormed over to Tiberius and caved in his head with a chair leg, promptly killing him. And this was the first time that political disputes had led to widespread fatal violence in hundreds of years. This showed that the Senate and the patrician class were willing to use violence and were brutally opposed to any attempts that would circumvent their authority. Thirty years later, their fears would be realized as the Republic found itself again embroiled in a bitter and violent situation as for the first time in Roman history, a Roman general would march on Rome. Lucius Cornelius Sulla, a general of some renown, had been given a prestigious command of an army to fight against Mithridates who was incurring on Roman territory. For Romans, an important command was one of the very few ways where they could grow their fame and reputation. A command once given is extremely difficult to withdraw, but unfortunately for Sulla, another ex-consul and famous general, Caius Marius, had also wanted the command to renew his prestige and popularity, and Marius would use a loyal tribune to pass the law, giving him the command instead of Sulla. Sulla, being extremely bitter about this, refused to allow his dignity and reputation to be dented and decided on more extreme measures. Sulla would soon call forward his legions and would explain that his reputation and theirs had been attacked. Rome had attempted to disgrace him for no good reason other than to tarnish their name. He told them that the only way to right this wrong was to march. Later, after a few brief skirmishes, Sulla would successfully enter the city and take control of the Republic. Soon Sulla would take his legions and march to the east to fight against Mithridates. And it was at this point that Marius would return and execute several senators for disloyalty. But Marius would soon die as he was already 70 years old, and after defeating Mithridates, Sulla would return and kill a significant portion of the senate. Sulla's prescriptions were some of the deadliest acts the Republic had ever seen. Names were added to kill lists, often arbitrarily, for simply being rich. 
and once the rich were killed, their property would be sold to sell as allies for steep discounts. This would encourage the killing of the most respected and wealthy senators. Eventually, after the senate leadership was almost completely wiped out, Sulla would declare himself dictator. But Sulla never had long-term plans for dictatorship however, and after 3 years he would retire and die in 78 BC. At this point, the senate saw what a dangerous man with unlimited power could do. Under Sulla, the senate's authority and prestige had significantly diminished, and though Sulla had tried to maintain some norms, nothing could be approved without his say-so, and nobody's glory and power could rival the dictators. After Sulla's death, the senate gradually began to reassert itself, as most of the prestigious family names and well-respected Romans still resided in that body. But over a decade later, a new conspiracy would revive many painful memories of the previous era. During the consul elections of 63 BC, Lucius Catiline spent a massive sum in bribes to procure a favorable result. He borrowed and accrued a significant amount of debt which would ruin him if he failed to win the election. Unfortunately, this is exactly what happened. In this period of Rome, there were usually two types of candidates those that would align themselves with the wealthy, and those that would try to win favor by inciting the prejudice of the people. And the latter was the group that Catiline belonged to. Catiline championed himself as a representative of the people, but this would lose him many friends in the senate who feared that he was playing a dangerous game. As expected, senators were very protective of their authority and they had previously witnessed what an ambitious and desperate man could do to the republic. After the election, financially ruined and facing certain exile, Catiline had decided to make his move. His plan was to collect enough weapons, mobilize a large contingency force, and wait for the perfect moment. However, before this could be done with maximum effect and surprise, a mistress who received first-hand information of the plot would turn the information over to the current consul Cicero. Cicero sat on this until anonymous letters were delivered to senior senators warning them of an upcoming massacre. Cicero then confronted Catiline in front of the senate who would deny the charges passionately, but Catiline would soon leave Rome to join his army. It was at this point that other conspirators had attempted to persuade a friendly tribe to rebel so that they could open a second front and distract the senate's forces. But this tribe would immediately betray them and relay the information to Cicero, which led to their prompt arrest and admission of guilt. Here is where Caesar comes in. Now that the senate had arrested the conspirators, the question became what to do with the captives. During the debates, Caesar suggested that they be imprisoned for life as death was too lenient of a punishment. Marcus Cato, a common critic of Caesar, then spoke up and said punishment should be death, and he would say that Caesar's attempts at leniency were perhaps related to a guilty conscience. After a brief back and forth, the senate had approved Cato's resolution on executing the prisoners. And as the debate was ending, Caesar was mobbed by an angry crowd and almost beaten or worse. So why did Cato, an important and well-respected member of the senate, despise Julius Caesar so much? Julius Caesar was an extremely flamboyant senator. He was well known for his odd idioms, wardrobe, fixation on appearance, and use of the public to secure popularity. Caesar was also well known for hosting huge feasts and games for the public, and was someone that would defend important men in trial. He was an exceptional orator, and most of all, a philanderer. Caesar had slept with the wives of many senators and had a long-lasting affair with Cato's half-sister, Servilla. As the years went by, Cato started to view Caesar as a moral threat to the Republic. He saw that Caesar was an ambitious man that was willing to ally himself with corrupt actors to promote his career. Now for the most part, corruption was normal, but Cato thought that Caesar went beyond norms, especially when the latter joined up with two of the richest men in Rome, Pompey and Crassus, in the creation of the first triumvirate. Cato would view this alliance as a corrupt bargain and that Caesar had unearned influence and power. What made matters worse was that Cato's son-in-law in his co-consulship with Caesar had been embarrassed and had feces dumped on him as he tried to block some of Caesar's legislative prerogatives. Typically, at the end of a consulship, the former consul would be given command in a Roman territory to administer the province. 
and subsequently, Caesar would be sent to administer Transpaltine Gaul. And it was during his time at Gaul that Caesar would make a name for himself as a military genius. After dominating the province and crushing the rebellions, Caesar had garnered the fierce loyalty of his legions and immense wealth to influence political matters in the Republic. Cato would view this power by an undeserving figure like Caesar as dangerous. He denounced him as a war criminal and would even suggest that he be given to the Gauls as punishment for his war crimes. Though this wasn't taken seriously at the time, Cato did command immense influence and his constant barbs against Caesar did leave a lasting impression on the minds of many senators. Cato in fact was so incensed by Caesar's actions that he threatened to prosecute him once he was legally allowed to do so. During this time, Caesar as consul and governor of Gaul had been immune to prosecution. But soon his term as governor would be coming to a close and he would have to give up his legions. However, Caesar hoped to run for consul for a second time before actually having to give up his legions. But in order to run for consul, he would have to enter the city and give up his imperium or his right to hold an army. Usually, someone in Caesar's position would be granted a special privilege to allow him to run for consul in absentia. But Cato and his senate allies were unwilling to do this and refused to compromise. Now fearful of what Caesar might do, they gave special privileges to Pompey and in broad terms passed laws that would enable Pompey to defend the Republic by whatever means necessary. Negotiating, Caesar said that he would give up his imperium if Pompey would do so first. In return, Pompey said that Caesar, as a testament to his goodwill, must be the one that gives up his imperium first. Another suggestion was made that both of them give up Imperium at the same time, but this was later rejected. Now, it's important to realize that though this issue might seem trivial to a modern viewer, it was extremely significant in Caesar's time. If Caesar gave up Imperium first, then he risked possible prosecution and an uncertain future regarding his chance at the consulship. His reputation and political career would run the risk of ruin. Pompey, being awarded immense powers by the Senate, also faced the possible denigration of his reputation. For decades, Pompey was the most popular figure in Rome. He was considered the most capable military general and was given the nickname Magnus, which meant the Great. It was not acceptable for Pompey and his powerful Senate friends for him to give up Imperium first. And it was at this critical juncture that Julius Caesar would cross the Rubicon, informally declaring war as this was strictly forbidden under Roman law. Once the Rubicon was crossed, he would be considered a fugitive, subject to arrest, and possible execution. Now to recap, since 133 BC, the Roman Senate had heard about tribunes attempting to gather popularity by violating norms and circumventing their authority. They had seen an ambitious man with military genius march on Rome and murder hundreds of their colleagues, declare himself a dictator, and take complete charge of day-to-day -day decision making. And they had seen right after Sulla, a failed candidate for consulship, conspire to overthrow the Republic and raise an army. And now, at least in their eyes, Julius Caesar was attempting to do the same thing. Here was an ambitious man with massive popularity, massive wealth, and a knack for winning against all odds. They had seen this before and rallied against Caesar with all their might, putting all their hopes in Pompey Magnus. In the ensuing civil war, Caesar would prove victorious and many of the leading senators who had opposed him would perish. Cato would commit suicide in Africa and Pompey would be beheaded in Egypt after fleeing in the aftermath of Pharsalus. But those that didn't die in battle or commit suicide were pardoned by Caesar, including Cicero and Brutus. Once Caesar had returned victorious after the civil war, his main priority was to avoid civil discord. Those that would ask for a pardon were usually granted. There were no mass executions, property owned by senators killed in battle were not sold at cheap discounts, but one thing was clear, Caesar was in complete control and he was not likely to give it up. He had made himself dictator for life and though the senate still existed, it had no authority and was just a rubber stamp for Caesar. Rome was effectively controlled by one man. And though there were no mass executions and mass violence, the power that the senate had enjoyed for so many decades was transferred to Caesar. 
One would think that if Caesar could be taken out of the picture, then power would inevitably return back to the Senate. Eventually, some 60 senators would come together to conspire to assassinate Julius Caesar. As is usual with those that have obtained absolute power, Caesar had received many death threats. He would have a Spanish bodyguard, but he had dismissed them after the Senate pledged an oath of loyalty to him and formed a new bodyguard consisting of senators. On March 15th, 44 BC, as Caesar entered the Senate chamber and sat down, he was surrounded by conspirators. One of them began to urge Caesar to recall his brother, who was serving overseas. As more of the conspirators gathered around and begged Caesar to grant the plea, he continued to refuse. And it was at this point that one of them, Lucius Cimber, moved behind Caesar and pulled his toga down. This was the agreed upon signal for the attack to begin. Casca revealed a dagger and attempted to stab Caesar, but was so nervous that he only grazed his shoulder. Seeing this, Caesar would shout at Casca, but then more senators drew daggers and began to swarm. Caesar fought valiantly trying to escape, but he was encircled. And though in front of hundreds of senators that had benefited from his dictatorship and pledged their loyalty, only two of them had tried to help. After being stabbed in the groin and seeing that it was Brutus, he would reportedly say, You too, my son, and stopped fighting. He would pull his toga over his head and collapse at the feet of the statue of Pompey Magnus. He was stabbed over 23 times, just one of them being fatal. In the aftermath, despite pleas for calm and the Senate confirming that all of Caesar's acts were legal, a mob would form, burn down the Senate building, and soon another civil war would begin. This would lead to the rise of Emperor Augustus and the death of the Roman Republic. And that is the assassination of Julius Caesar. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe and comment below. Thank you again for watching and we'll see you next time.